Okay, let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started, if we could. I know it's uh, friendly chatter. Uh, full house is friendly chatter. It's awesome. Uh, the, the last two weeks for Sunday school, we've combined the two adult classes, and we've been covering uh, finance, money, some budgeting, saving, contentment, gratitude. And uh, last week, I was not able to be here. Jackie had an oh, incident. I took my time for a few days. She's back. Um, but today we have a guest speaker, Brian Clay. Is and I'll just introduce him as a good friend, a uh, financial advisor of myself, uh, my mom and dad. Uh, Corey goes to him also. Bill, I think Bill's met with him. So he's out of New Haven. Um, he's a Christian man, and uh, I'll give him. You can just take the stage. And well, first of all, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'll probably walk because I can't stand still. My name's Brian Clay. So first of all. Um, I need to introduce myself. So I have three children. So my daughter, Sydney, she's she's not real tall. She's about this tall. She's 22. Okay, you guys don't know the response. You're supposed to go, aww. <laughs> <laughs> we just didn't know. So good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Brian Clay. I'll just do my little introduction. So I have a daughter. Her name is Sydney. <laughs> she's 22. Aww. Aww. So nice. <laughs> Um, true story, my son now is 20. Um, he plays college soccer over at Taylor University. I don't know if you guys have heard of Taylor. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's just weird. Then I have a son who is 17, almost 18. He's a senior senior in high school. His name is Trenton. Yes. Is that good? Yeah. <laughs> weird too. Okay. And, uh, my wife, Jill. Uh, <laughs> So my wife, Jill, we've been married 26 years. Good. 26 years. I do the whole thing all over. Um, so I grew up in Fort Wayne, and I went to Blackhawk Christian High School. I don't know if you guys know Blackhawk Christian over there. I graduated way back in 1988. Went to Anderson University. I studied business, and I studied Christian education, and I minored in marriage family therapy. <laughs> so I thought I was going to be a marriage counselor. Oh, then I got married right when I graduated from high school, college. Not high school. Um, so my wife and I, 26 years, but I realized I know nothing about marriage. <laughs> so like, you can study it all you want, but until you live with someone, it's not reality. So we have three kids. I joined Edward Jones almost 17 years ago. So I was a youth pastor for six years. I am still a teaching pastor. Um, I teach at Brookside Church. Some people go to, it sounds like, Bible Study Fellowship there. So I've been there for 21 years as a teaching pastor. So I do this. I go to churches sometimes and preach. Um, I preach at my own church on a regular basis, and then I'm a financial planner. So I have no idea why I'm here today. So here's what we want to do. I want to talk to you just about what lessons that I've learned about finances. Is that okay? Um, so when I came to Edward Jones, there are some very complicated financial topics. So I had to find a way to take what I would say are complicated financial topics and make them at least reasonable to talk about. Does that seem fair? So did anybody ever see um, Bozo the Clown? Anybody ever seen Bozo the Clown? Oh, yes! yes. Okay. Uh, my wife grew up in Chicago with WGN, the television WGN. And Bozo was on there. And then at the end of the show, there was a game that they played. What was it called? Anybody know? It's called the Grand Prize Game. And Bozo had six buckets that you had to throw ping pong balls into. Does anybody remember this? And if you could throw a ping pong ball into the last bucket, you won a bicycle. Um, now, in Fort Wayne, we kind of tried to replicate it, and we called it Happy's Place. Wow, some of you guys remember this? I feel like I'm at home. This is awesome. Um, and so, in fact, my friend, his name's Adrian Gunther, he was actually Happy the Hobo. It's a whole other story. So, what I'm going to give you today, does anyone have pens, pencils, markers, crayons, piece of chalks, highlighter, eyeliner, lip gloss, lipstick, blood? I mean, anything that will physically write 
Um, I'm going to pick on Larry. Larry, can I ask you, I don't know that I'm going to have enough for every person, so sometimes couples can share. Will you pass these out for me? So you can share, but I'm going to have you need a pencil or a pen, marker, crayons, chalk, highlighter, highlighter, lip gloss, share. Good. One of you can be the scribe. Let's see. The old building, great question. So 1988, they were building the new building. So I'm one of the work. You were in the new building building it? I wasn't building it. I was doing the drywall. Well, thank you. Yeah, I never got to. My kids all went to Blackhawk. So now it's the building's beautiful. They just built a whole other building. I don't know how they have all this money, but they must. They're charging me way too much on tuition. Okay, so you should have a page that has six buckets. Everybody? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so here's what I get asked all the time. Um, what does God teach us about money management? You guys are learning a little bit about that, I hear. So we're learning things about contentment, gratitude. Have we learned some of those things? So I always pause when I'm at other churches and say, okay, so what have you learned so far? This is good pressure for the teachers. Teachers are not allowed to answer at this point. Good. So what kind of things have we learned so far in this study? And I hear your pastor is actually teaching on this right now. So give me anything you've learned these last, what is it, three weeks? 10, 10, 80. Ooh, so what would you say 10, 10, 80 means? 10% to God, 10% uh, savings, and 80% for your bills and whatever. Neat concept. There's a company, if you're driving out towards Columbia City, called 8020. Anybody know 8020? What's the principle there? What happened? Why did they name it 8020? 20% 20 of your volume takes up 80% of your time. Oh, awesome. The goal was for the person who founded it to give away 80% and to live on 20. Hmm. It kind of flips that, doesn't it? So what if you could give away 80, meaning to tithing or to savings, and then actually live off of 20? Oh, that's an interesting concept. Okay, what else have you learned, though? God holds it all. Yeah, but what about, does he own that too? But does God know your financial position? Does God care about your financial position? Yes. Um, so I always tell people it's easy to say it. It's another thing to live it. Um, and I, I fall into that category too. Um, because I think, Larry was pointing out to me even this morning, that that beast of I want it and I need it comes into my life often. That friends or neighbors, oh, my neighbor's yard looks so nice. I get lawn envy. Do you guys get lawn envy ever? Maybe not. Um, so you don't. Good. I get lawn envy. I live in suburbia. And so one of our neighbors, I don't know, he had this, some special tool, I think. And now if I just had that tool, my yard could be like, does that make sense? Um, maybe not. That's my life. Um, and so I get into that habit of looking at other people and saying, I wish I had what they had. Um, so, what I want to teach you today is a structure that I use. It's six buckets. Um, I use this with all of my clients, and I want to walk you through it. It'll require some writing on your behalf. So, on the first bucket, top left hand, if you would just write the word debt, D-E-V-T, debt. You can write right in the bucket, debt. So, here's my first question. The average American who retires at age 65, what do they have saved for retirement? The average American has less than $20,000 saved for retirement. Um, and so most Americans simply live on Social Security. They live on it. No pensions, nothing like that. They just live on Social Security. And the reason we see it is because of the first bucket. What's the first bucket? Yeah. Um, next to the bucket, if you'll write down these three words kind of underneath each other, I would write next to the bucket on the right-hand side, right-hand side of the bucket that says that, write the word house. Next to the bucket, write the word cars. And next to the bucket, write the word credit cards. Those are the three major debts that I see in people's lives. Their house, their car, and their credit cards. Here's what I tell people. 
you need to find out what interest you're paying on those. So in all honesty, anybody still paying on their house? I am. Anyone still paying on their house? Can I see a rate? Good. Do you know your interest rate? Yes. Here's what I would tell you. One of the things that I try to tell people you have to learn is you need to know some of your numbers. And so give me an example. What's your interest rate on your house? 5%. 5%. Good. Oh, only one person? Good. Oh, what'd you say? Three and a half? Three and a half. 3.7. Um, today, um, we're in October. Next month, interest rates on a 30-year mortgage are going to be at five. We're in a rising interest rate environment. So those days of threes, we will probably never see them in our lifetime again. We probably will not. We're not going to see low interest rates. On cars, does anyone borrow money for a car? Do you know your interest rate on your car loan? Whoa, what? Two points. Three or something like that. Two! Okay. <laughs> yes, it's nice. It's still awesome. Two. Uh, today, we're going to be getting close to 6% now. Interest rates are rising. 6% to borrow money. What about credit cards? Anybody know or you just ignore your interest rate on your credit cards? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. So what did you say? Every month I pay it Okay, some people don't, and because they're like me, they want to go out and buy that weed trimmer thing, right? And they put it on a credit. And what are typical rates today for credit cards? 18 to 26. I had a client in, I should say, I had a prospect in, 31% rate on a credit card. 31. And they're borrowing money on it. So when people come into my office, the first thing I want to know is, tell me about your debt situation. Right? Because I can't go any further financial planning for you until we take care of your debt bucket, until we take care of that bucket. There is nothing else that's more important. I don't mind you having a house payment. I don't mind you having a car payment. I don't like you having credit card payments. Because credit card at 18 and 22%, that will stop your ability to even give, to tithe. It'll stop you. You will not progress in life. So if you have those credit cards, can I just encourage you? There's a system in Fort Wayne. It's called Consumer Credit Counseling Service. Consumer Credit Counseling Service. They will help you get out of debt. Does that make sense? So then I take an arrow, and I draw an arrow from the debt bucket down to the next bucket. So you'll draw a little arrow from the debt down to the next. It's kind of like a little overflow line. Like, oh, yes, make it pretty. Oh, nice job. Well done. Okay. The next bucket is cash. The next bucket is cash. And people say this, well, how much cash should I have? I have um, clients who are in their 90s, and what they do is they stockpile gold right now. You guys know about this? Yeah, gold. Oh. Gold and silver, junk silver, uh, silver dollars, and then they actually have silver bars and then gold bars. So how much cash should the normal person have? Any ideas? Six months. Six months. Six months. Of your bills and income. You six months of your bills and income. Is that what you said to you? Six, six months of your bills and income. Here's what I tell people. Take your annual income, whatever it is. Now, you're going to come up with the same number that they just said. But take your annual income. Let's say you make $40,000 times it by 70%. Most people take home about 70% of their pay. So if you're working still, you get about 70% of your pay. And then times that by three or five. So it's three to six months of your livable income. So take 70% of your annual income. Um, and then times it by three or six months, whichever one you want as an emergency fund. What, where should that emergency fund be? So this cash, where should you put it? Oh, this is a great question. What? They should see you. No, I got to make sure I'm on time. Okay. So what I tell people is some of it needs to be in checking and savings. But some of it, if it's emergency money, what does checking and savings pay today? A lot of people are making right now 0 0.01. Okay? Well, you guys, that's not a good place to have your, we call that lazy money. So part of your checking and savings, I'll give you an example. Parkview Hospital right now 
is building onto their building. If you drive by Parkview's North Campus, they have like cranes and they're adding five stories. They're borrowing about a hundred million dollars. hundred million dollars. You know who they're going to borrow it from? You all. They want to. They would like to pay you four and a half percent tax free right now to borrow your money. Tax free. Federally tax free, state and local tax free. That's not a bad deal, is it? So you could give some of your money to Parkview and they'll pay you four and a half. That's more than 0.01. I just want to make sure everybody understood that. <laughs> four and a half is bigger than 0.01. So I tell my clients, some of your money should be actually in checking and savings, but that emergency fund, some of it should be in things that are going to grow a little bit faster, but you can still get access to any business day. Does that make sense? Draw an arrow to your next bucket. Now, those of you who are older than 65, I'm still going to be talking to you. The next bucket is 401k. 401k. So, some of you in the room are still working. Who are my working people still? Oh, majority. Wow. Very young over on the side. I saw a child with you, though. <laughs> Excellent. So, um, for my working people, how much money should you be putting into your 401k? Mm -hmm. Wait, who, I heard it. How much is possible? Ooh. To maximize it. Mm -hmm. You could, could. I tell people this, only put in what your company matches. That's yeah. right. Uh, I knew you were going to match Okay, so this is good questions. So I will take questions from the audience. What was the question again? What if your company doesn't match? And I would not put anything into the 401k. So I'm going to explain this to you in a moment. This is now again, you don't have to take my advice. Okay? I've only been doing it 17 years. I'm not real good at it, so um, I should tell you this. I think I probably legally had to, too. So I have my Series 7, which means I can sell stocks, bonds, CDs, collateralized mortgages, unit investment trusts. I have my 66 and my 63. Those are law licenses for the state of Indiana. That means nothing to you. I have my life insurance, health insurance, long-term care, and disability licenses. That means I have to take classes every two years, and yeah, it's horrible. And then I have an AAMS, that means nothing to you. I know that that was 11 more college classes that I took. And I'm currently in my master's program with Wake Forest University and getting what's called a CFP and an MBA. I know that means nothing, okay? What it means is I would only put in what the company matches. That's what I've learned. So if your company gives you 3%, I want you to put in... Because what is that then? It's six and it's free money. <laughs> if I can have someone give me free money, I'm going to take the free money. But I'm not going to give them any more, and I'm going to show you why in a minute, than what they're going to match me. So if I was 31 years old, someone in the room might be 31. Might be. Okay, if I was 31 and working, I would only put in what my company matches. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so draw a line underneath those buckets. Those, those buckets, just draw a line across your page. So those top three buckets are buckets you control. I do not have control over those buckets. You control your debt, you control your cash, and you control your 401k. A lot of times people come to my office and say, we're thinking about investing money. I don't want you to invest until you've done those top three buckets. I'll give you an example. Probably six, eight years ago, I had the lottery winners from New Haven come into my office. They got referred to me. It was really cool. They won a million dollars in the lottery. A million dollars! Now, they came to me after they had already gone down to meet with the lottery um, department down in Indianapolis. They met with the lottery people. They came into my office, and they said, we are so excited. We won a million dollars. And I was like, I'm pretty excited that you won a million dollars. <laughs> Does that make sense? And so they said, you've been referred to so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. All recommended you. We'd love to meet with you. And I told them, I have to be honest, I don't take a lot of new clients. And I don't. I don't take on a lot of new clients. Because I like the people who I work with. And so if I take someone else on, it means I don't have as much time to spend with Larry. Believe me, he needs a lot of time. <laughs> okay? So I'm, I'm explaining this to them, and, and I started at the very top. What did I start with? Yeah. I did. I said, so kind of tell me about right now your house. You know, tell me about your home. And they said, oh, well, we got foreclosed on. And so we weren't making our payments, and so we got foreclosed on. The bank's still trying to get around $26,000 from us. They're tr they're, we're on the hook. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And I said, that's, that's okay. Um, any other debts? You know, I said cars, and they said, oh, here's an interesting story. My husband, we bought a car from a friend. It was $23,000. We financed it. 
My husband didn't get insurance on it, and then he wrecked it, um, and it's totaled, so we still owe on it, but we can't drive it. That's interesting. A little note there. And then I said, do you have any other debts? And they said, well, the good news is we don't really have any credit card debts. And I was like, whoo, because that's a big one for people, right? And they said, but we do have student loans. And they had both gone back, and they were studying um, some type of radiology. They were going to be radiologist techs. Does that make sense? X-rays and those things. They had each borrowed in the neighborhood of forty to fifty thousand dollars for schooling. So here was the, the story: they owed one hundred and thirty thousand dollars, and they had no assets. They didn't have a house. They didn't have a car. They had no assets. And then I said, "Well, at least." You won the lottery. I mean, we can pay some of these things off. And she said, oh, when we were down there, we chose a 20-year payout. So we get $50,000 a year each um, September. After taxes, $36,000. Oh, now how do you feel about winning the lottery? <laughs> you follow this all of a sudden? And so they, they said, our goal is for both of us to just kind of quit our jobs. Yeah. <laughs> Why are you laughing? You're not financial planners. <laughs> they both wanted to quit their jobs, stay home, and raise these three kids. And guess what I told them? I'm on the first bucket. They said, um, I'm, I am, I'm not Harry Potter. Like, I'm not a wizard here. There is no magic. I said, honestly, you have to go to credit counseling. So we have to stop kind of our conversation. I can't be helpful to you at this point. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so what happens is you're responsible for the top three buckets. If there's any money left over, it flows into one of three buckets. Now, I wish I had learned this when I was 18. So those of you who are older than 18, I'm sorry that you're going to learn it today. There are three places your money can go. And so I want you to label the buckets this. The first one across the bottom is taxable. The second one is tax deferred, and the third bucket is tax free. So it would be taxable, tax deferred, and tax free. Do you see those three buckets? Taxable, tax deferred, and then tax free is the third bucket. Here's what I like to call them. So you can put this underneath the bucket. If you wrote on the bucket, you can put this underneath it. The first bucket I call the today bucket. That's the today bucket. The second bucket is your tomorrow bucket. And the last bucket is your never again bucket. <laughs> so what that means is when do you want to pay taxes? Do you want to pay taxes today? Do you want to pay them tomorrow? Or do you want to pay them never again? Hey, don't be jumping ahead. You're not a financial planner. <laughs> okay, so I'll give you an example. Your taxable today bucket, does anybody have checking and savings? At the end of the year, you're going to get what's called a 1099, and you have to pay taxes on it. Guess when? Today. Anybody have a 401k that you've had? And you're maybe even some of my retirees. Did you guys have 401ks, yeah. IRAs, 403bs? Into an IRA. Yeah, and so it's in the middle bucket. We call that tax deferred. That IRA is in the middle bucket. Your 401k, in the middle bucket. What it means is someday in the future, tomorrow, you're going to pay taxes on that money. Does that make sense? Yeah. It sounds really good until when? Yeah. Until you start taking it out. That was perfect. Well done. <laughs> My dad worked for Lincoln Life for almost 40 years. Um, all of his money he put into his 401k. So he stockpiled money in his 401k. He maxed it out. And so now in retirement, guess where all his money is? It's in his 401k, which is which bucket? The middle. The middle bucket, which is meaning every time he takes money out, he owes money to the government. So he'll call me up and say something like this. This is hypothetical. He'll say, I'm thinking about buying a car. I'm like, oh, Dad, do you really need a new car? He bought <clears throat> a Lexus 350. Here? Stop. No. <laughs> I'm his financial planner. <laughs> so um, I drive a 2005. That's what I drive. I try to keep it up, but I drive a 13-year-old vehicle. So my dad wanted to get a new one of these costs. Almost $50,000. 
Let me give you an example. He calls up and says, hey, Brian, I'm thinking about buying this. Like, I need $50,000. How much do I have to take out of his account to get him 50? Seventy-five to $80,000. And it's taxable this year. What happened to my dad's income then? Whoa! He's in a new tax bracket. Do you follow what just happened? Yeah. And so I'll say, Dad, I have to take out seventy-five thousand, and he'll say, Well, I don't need seventy-five thousand. I only need fifty. So just take out fifty. And I say, Dad, if I take out fifty, you're only going to get thirty-five. Well, I don't need thirty-five. I need. I was like, Dear Lord, Dad, let me just take care of it. Okay? Does that make sense? So it sounds really good until you're retired and you're taking the money out. The last bucket is called tax-free. Those are things like Roth IRAs. You guys ever heard of those? Roth IRAs? They are also 529 plans, 529s or college saving plan. Municipal bonds, that's like that park view bond, those are tax free. And then even life insurance falls into that bucket. So let me explain this to you. If you have money left over, meet with someone and say, where do I really need the money? Do I need today money? Because I need access to it now. Um, if you're still working, you can still do that middle bucket, tax deferred. And if you're still working, you can still get some money into that tax-free. Even if you're retired, there are some options in that tax-free bucket. What you really need to do is understand the difference between the three buckets. Did that make sense? Any questions on the three buckets? I just want to be conscious of our time. Any questions on those things? So if you have money that you're not putting into your 401k, let's say you're doing 7% right now. I would tell you just do the match with the company. Take that 4% that you were giving to your company and put it into a Roth. You can do it online. You can call a financial person. You can normally do it at your local bank. But you guys, that's going to help you more in the long term because in retirement, you're going to take the money out tax-free. You're never going to pay taxes on it again. I want to give you a heads up for those of you who tithe and you give. Your middle bucket, anybody in here have who's retired, have an IRA. I have one, two, three. Oh, good. So some people do. Anyone in the room, retired, have an IRA, and you're over 70? I got one, two, three, just three of you. If you're over 70, you have to take money out each year. It's called a required minimum distribution. It's been sitting in that bucket so long, the government finally says, you have to take the money out, right? They want their taxes. So you have to take out money each year. You can give it right to a church or a charity, right out of the account, and it goes as a tax contribution. So it's a charitable contribution on your taxes. So you can give right from your IRA, not take the money out. Let me give you an example. If my dad takes the money out, he $100 comes out, he only gets 80. Let's say he gets 70. And then he can give $70 to a church. Does that make sense? And he would get a tax deduction for $70. Or he could literally give the hundred dollars right out of his account. He needs to have the church buy him a car. <laughs> I gotta write your name down. Okay. So that was my buckets presentation. Any questions just on the buckets? Any questions on the buckets? So how many to take that IRA, the money right out of the IRA into into a charity. So I have clients who we take every month and we literally do their time. And so out of their IRA, we set up just a systematic check that goes to their church. And there's no taxes withheld. And so they have to meet that required minimum distribution. For some of my clients, it's obviously thousands of dollars. And they say, oh, I don't need the money. I'd love to give it to the church. They used to take it out, pay taxes, and then give it to the church. They didn't know they could take it right out of that middle bucket and give it right to their church. Did that make sense? I also need to tell you this. On that tax-free bucket, this, the laws have changed. There's something called a 529 plan. My kids go to private school. I don't know if anyone has anyone who goes to a parochial school or a Lutheran school. Do we have anyone like that where you have kids in some type of school like that? Good, no one. Okay, so... If you choose to send your child to a private school, you can put money into a 529 plan now, and you can pay the school and you get a tax deduction in a sense. It's actually called a tax credit. We used to do it just for colleges. 
So my kids, let's say their tuition at Blackhawk is $5,000 a year. I can put money into that plan, take it out, give it to the school, and I get $1,000 cash back from the state of Indiana. So if you know someone K through 12 who's in any type of um, paid school, okay, so Canterbury counts, Concordia, Bishop Dwayners, Bishop Lures, um, any of those schools, you can put the money in and literally the next day take the money out. There's no holding period and you get credit. And that, I mean, that's not just K-12, the new law now is K-12. And college, college too. Correct. It was college. just college, but they've now opened it up to school for younger kids. Okay, Larry, this is my last sheet. I think I'm doing great on time. So here's what I hear people say. Um, Brian, I hear the stock market is up. Why are not all of my investments up? Oh, this is a million dollar question. Um, the stock market is up. So right now the s and is probably up four to six percent for this year. Standard and Poor's, S&P. You have to understand this today if you're ever gonna invest money. So I'm giving you a sheet. Yeah, don't turn it over. Uh, yeah, keep that page. Oh, you can turn it over this way though. I, should, I was wrong. You can. <laughs> okay, so you should be looking at a very crazy picture, yes. So what you're looking a picture at is the S&P 500 on the front. Now, um, what five companies are the largest companies? Anyone want to guess one of them? Oh, yes, Apple is one of them. Can you guess another one? Amazon. Amazon. Now, the weird one is the third one. What, what's the name of that company? Which is actually Google. It's not a serial company. That is a great question. Okay, so Alphabet is Google. They've renamed themselves Alphabet. What's number four? Microsoft. And number five? Facebook. Okay, so let's take a minute. Those five companies make up 20% of the S&P 500. So make sure you understand this. The S&P 500 is something that we call a market cap weighted index. I know it's a weird term. All it means is this. If the company gets bigger, they get a bigger share of the movement of the market. So right now, Apple makes up over about 4% of the movement of the market. So if Apple goes up, what's most likely to happen to the market? It's gonna go up if Apple goes up. How about if Apple, Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Microsoft go up? What do all those companies have in common right now? Oh. When's the last time that this happened in our stock market? Any idea? A few years ago. 1998. Anyone know what happened in 2000, 2001, 2002? I lost shoes though. Yeah, the worst financial crisis that we had ever seen since the Great Depression. Um, we had all tech companies leading back in 1998. Today, these are the five largest companies. Now the difference is they have real returns. But I want to make sure you understand how much influence they have on the market. So turn your page over. Those five companies are now worth four trillion dollars. Four trillion dollars. The bottom, I think it's 282. Is that what I've put? 282 companies on the bottom S&P 500 are worth four trillion. So those five companies are worth more than 282 other companies combined in the S&P 500. The reason I'm telling you this is you're going to hear things like, well, the market is up. Why is my 401k not up? It's because in your 401k, you don't own the market. Did that make sense? I want you to get a perspective. I try to tell my clients this, that we're, you're investing for the long term. I don't try to make money overnight. I don't buy Baidu and Zybernaut and you guys already know these companies, but I'm sure being, what I try to buy is things are gonna be good long term. Um, so people today are chasing things, they're chasing marijuana stocks. <laughs> For real. Canada just approved it this last week. It's a national law now. Uh, marijuana can be used nationally in Canada. Um, Indiana, we're gonna be one of the last states, but I have to tell you, CBD oil is becoming, there's probably people in this room using CBD oil. You can oil. get it. What? You can get it. Oh, you can, get it, you can get it at the convenience store now, like at a gas station for CBD oil. So the other day, my mom came back from her pain management. She has arthritis, and guess what my mom was prescribed? She's like, I have to get this new. I'm like, Mom, you, 
do you know what that is? She's like, yeah, it's CBD oil. I'm like, well, do you know it's cannabis? What? <laughs> Mom said it. She's like, what? So I asked her, are you using it? She's like, well, yes, I'm using it. She's so happy. Yeah. <laughs> her hair's growing long. My dad's got dreadlocks now. <laughs> they have all those psychedelic lights in their living room now. They listen to Bob Marley a lot. It's weird. The point is this. Don't compare yourselves to others, okay? That's the biggest problem my clients have, is comparing themselves to others. No one's financial situation is like yours, no one. Um, you've made decisions that have gotten you to this point, and so if I can encourage you, you don't have to meet with me. I don't, I don't ever encourage people to meet with me. Don't meet with me. Find somebody who you trust. One of the greatest questions that got asked the other night was, if I'm going to win, you guys know what this Mega Millions is worth now? One and a half billion. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're on, yeah. Um, and so no one won it Friday night. Um, and so, again, yeah, it's over a billion, a billion, a billion dollars. It is correct. It is correct. It's over a billion and a half. Now, here's the question. So what should you do if you win the Mega Million? Call you, call you. <laughs> <laughs> Can I encourage you? Don't if you win, don't call. <laughs> because I would want to have a financial plan in place before you win. Go on vacation. So, so this is call the, you. No, before. <laughs> call me now. Here's what we tell you. You need to be planning for life events before they happen. Um, and so I have to tell you, this last week in my office, we had a gentleman in New Haven. He's 45 years old, and he passed away. Um, he died in his living room with his wife and his 12-year-old son. Okay, 45 years old. And then I met the wife after he died. She's 48. Um, and now her question is, what do I do? Do you follow this? When would I have liked to have met them? Maybe three or four years ago. Do you follow this? Yeah. Because after the life event happens is when people say, okay, what do I do? Can I encourage you, find someone, talk to your friends and say, who do you use? Who do you trust? But find someone who can be that resource for you because they need to work you through those buckets. Does that make sense? Um, now, I'm gonna give you out a sheet. This is just a sheet that I give to a lot of people. Oh, look at poor Larry. You've had to hand out a lot. But this is just all the financial terms that we as financial people throw around just to act like we're smart. Does that make sense? But it explains literally all the financial jargon that we use in our industry. It's good at least to have for you. I would encourage you to hold on to it. Any questions, comments, quandaries, queries? Yes, I don't know your name, but you are who? Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, so what about the people who are saying, too late for that, or I don't have enough to get anything started? Or Great question. So first of all, it's never too late. Um, and so I always tell people, again, it's always good to sit down with someone else and get someone's advice looking at your opinion. Um, if someone charges you for that, don't go to them. That should always be done for free. And so good financial planners are going to sit down with you at no cost. The way we traditionally get paid is when you buy something from a financial person, they'll get paid a commission. So they might get paid when you buy a product from them. You would want to know what that commission is. The next way some people get paid is they charge a fee to manage your money. Does that make sense? And so those are the two ways that you can pay someone. You should always know what their commissions or their fees are before you ever do business with them. If someone's billing you to sit down with them and talk to them, don't go to them. Please, don't. There's too many good financial planners out there. Does that make sense? Okay, comments, quandaries, queries, questions. I just yes. Want to share something. We Please. We paid off our mortgage by having a whole lot of insurance on our physical home. Disability. Yeah. Insurance. And so we just saved it all these years, never really used it, but one time, and we were able to pay off our mortgage a couple weeks ago just because we didn't need it. That's what you clap. <laughs> I mean, honestly, that's awesome because that eliminates part of that debt bucket, right? Which lets more money go to cash and other things. So. Hey, boy. Um, you have used all, five, five, used all his questions today? 529. <laughs> yes, 529. 529. <coughs> Let's say Bill wants to put money into someone else's fund. Yes. Can you explain how to yeah, do that? Yeah, so the neat thing is you can give money to anyone you want to. Now, let us hear me out. So if you felt compassion on me, <laughs> I have two kids. I have one at Anderson and one at Taylor. So you said, Brian, we want to help you. Does that make sense? You, anyone can put money into a 529, 
and you will get the credit from both the Fed and the state. So you'll get a credit. The state will give you $1,000 back if you put $5,000 in. So you put in five, you get 1,000 back. If you put in $100, you'll get $20 back, it's 20%. But that means you could put money in for your grandchildren and you would get the credit. So again, if you say, this is money I'm gonna to leave to my children or my grandchildren anyway, why would you not give it to them while they're living? You get to see the joy from giving. It's amazing to me how many people die with huge amounts of money and both their children and their grandchildren are in need. And then they get that money after you're gone and they don't need it now. So my kids are in college. Soon I won't have any kids in college. I'll pay my house off and we won't have any debts. And then guess what's gonna happen? I'm gonna get a big lump sum from my parents or my in-laws. Does that make sense? Well, I don't need it then. It would be helpful, and I keep telling us, help your kids while they need it, and you can experience the gratitude then. Help your church while they need it, while you're still alive. It's intriguing how many of my clients leave money to churches after they pass away. Well, why don't you give it to the church while you're alive, and you can participate in the blessings. Does that make sense? Why are we waiting and saying, when I die, I'm going to give $100,000 to my church? Why don't we do it while we're living, and you can participate in the joys the church goes through then? And they're like, oh. I'm like, well, what if I need that money? Oh, you mean the 400 other thousand dollars that you have? Well, you might run out. You are 93. <laughs> Does that make sense? You guys, this is a reality, though. Even for some of you in this room, you're sitting on money. And I would tell you, pray about what God would really have you do with it. You've been given it. How are you using it to further the kingdom? Did that make sense? Yes? Is, is a 529 specifically colleges? And do you have to pick a college is my thought? Great question. No. In fact, you only have to pick a beneficiary. So if you pick uh, my daughter, at any point you could change it to anyone else because you're in control of the money. So you don't have to pick a college, you just pick who's going to get it. Okay, you're not saying this is for college. And if they don't go to college, you can change it. And you can always take your money back out. No taxes, no penalty. The only taxes and penalty are going to be charged on any gains that you make. Okay? Was that a hand up or you were resting your hand? Okay, yes, in the back. Can you have a singular 529 account with multiple recipients? Yeah, we, you, you can. It's really bad for the student. Um, and so you have a 529, it's part of their FAFSA disclosure. And so I had a client who lived up in North Dakota and he put all the money in his eldest grandson's name. Um, and so when John went to college, he had $85,000 in a 529 plan. Um, and so the university said, oh, you're able to pay. And he goes, well, that's not for me. That's for me and my eight other cousins. Does that make sense? But the university said it was his money and so we, had to call the guy in North Dakota and say, you have to break that up into all the grandchildren's accounts so the university doesn't just blame him or penalize him. So each individual needs an individual life. That's what I would do. And it doesn't cost anything to set up 529 plans. There's no cost to set up. You can do it direct through college choice or you can work with a financial plan either way. And it, it's the same cost either way. I encourage people to work with a financial planner. It makes taking withdrawals a little easier. Okay, I've taken up way too much time. You guys are supposed to be over on that side of the moment. Guys, wait, before you leave, let me at least pray. I am a pastor, so let me at least pray. God, thank you so much that we could spend time together just talking about the gifts that you've given us. God, I just pray that we become better stewards. God, you've entrusted each one. We are certainly blessed to live in this country. God, it is amazing what we have at our disposal here, and we take it for granted each day. So God, may we recognize the blessings that you pour out to us. God, may we invest in those things that are important, whether it's this church, God, our grandchildren, our children, even our parents, God. May you open up our eyes to the blessings that you've given us, and God, may we give back, and may we truly pay it forward. In Christ's name we pray, amen. amen. You guys, thank you for letting me come and share with you this morning.